want to earn more, work less and enjoy what you do each day? It's no secret, it can be done. This podcast with Dr. T will not only educate and inspire you, it will also teach you how to do more and be more with the time you already have. It will be like a shot of adrenaline straight into the heart of your business. Here is your host, Tyson Franklin. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of It's No Secret with Dr. T. With me today is Brad Sugars, and he started Action Coach back in 94 in Brisbane. And today the company is ranked as a leading business coaching franchise by Entrepreneur Magazine. It operates in over 70 countries and has more than 8,000 coaches. Now, that's a lot of coaches. And it does coaching with 15,000 businesses every single week. So, Brad, welcome to It's No Secret with Dr. T. He oh, is so cool to have you on here. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering why it took you so long to get me on the show. That's to be honest, you know. 1998 when we first met. 1998. Can you believe that? I know. It's been a long time. And you know what's really funny? When I started the podcast, I sat down and uh, somebody said, write a list of the, you know, the top 50 people you would love to have on your show. And you were on that list. And here I am. And Finally, he- we make it. Hey, this is great, buddy. <laughs> I'm really proud to be here and I'm really appreciating everything you're doing. I listened to a few of the podcasts over the weekend and uh, anyone that's listening for the first time should really subscribe. You got some great stuff going on here. This is what I love doing about the podcast. Sometimes I feel like it's like a really selfish experiment because I get so much out of every episode and 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 the feedback I get from people who do listen, yeah, they love the guest lineup, which is great. So let's give us a little bit of background. How did you start Action Coach? Uh, purely by accident, actually, where I think a lot of businesses end up by accident. I was uh, doing my own business up in Queensland many years ago and uh, I, I stumbled across just teaching people said to me hey can you come and speak at this event and then it was a big one Robert Kiyosaki asked me to go and speak at and and they actually paid me to go and speak and I thought this is fantastic that's awesome so I started teaching and all of a sudden people would all come up to me at the end of it and say hey could you help me can you help me and I I sort of said to a few of them listen I'm, I'm too busy running my own stuff and doing a few of these speeches why don't you just call me every week or every two weeks and I'll just coach you through a few things and then here we are 26 years later. Uh, we just opened in Russia, uh, country number 78, and uh, you know more than 1,000 officers around the world. It's kind of fun to think that every week we coach uh, thousands of business owners and uh, every month hundreds of thousands come through our group program. So it's kind of fun that way. Did you ever think it was going to be as big as what it is or has it gotten so much larger than your initial expectations? You know, about two years in, I sat down and wrote the vision for the company of world abundance through business re-education. And about six years in, I set the goal of being in 120 countries because McDonald's was in 119. So I thought I should be in 120. (laughs) That makes sense. Um, And we're well on the way. I think we opened three new countries this uh, quarter. And uh, next quarter, we open another four countries. So you know, we're on the way to the 120 countries. We're doing well. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's like any business. You keep growing and you keep uh, learning. And I'm lucky. I've, I've got a very strong team of people around me who do most of the work. I just get to be the front man and write the books and do the speeches these days. So when, when you're looking at a new country, is there a criteria or something you look for before you open up in that country? Is there um, it's got to tick a look, few boxes? We, yeah, look, we, we obviously look at economic data. Uh, we look at number of small businesses, medium businesses. We look at the legal environment and political and, I hate to say it, but war environment. Because uh, we're in you know that many countries now, places in Africa and that sort of thing. Some of the places in Latin America we choose not to go into just because of economic instability and political instability. Um, but other countries, it's really just about finding the right partners to open the market. We're finding the right humans to be on the ground with us uh, to open that business. Because as with everything in business, you know, you get the right people, you get the right business. So good people, great business. Okay. So I just want to ask you, you're now based in Vegas. Correct. Why, why, why did you choose Vegas? Even though I've said to a friend of mine that if I had to live in America... Not if I had to, like I love America. I go over there once or twice every year, but I would live in Vegas. I reckon Vegas, it just seems like I've been there three times. I love the place. You know, Vegas, the city is different to Vegas, the strip. So, but it does have the strip. I always try and describe the strip as kind of like our industrial zone. 
you know, we, we don't have an industrial zone. We have that area down there that pays all the taxes and keeps everybody employed. But it also means we have to have a lot of fun. See, where I live, uh, I'm sort of 10 miles away from the Strip. Uh, 10 minutes from my house, I have some of the best mountain hiking uh, in the world. The desert mountains here are beautiful in the Red Rock Canyons. 45 minutes, I've got the boat out on the water in Lake Mead in the, in the summer. And 45 minutes the other way, I'm up on uh, Mount Charleston, Lee Canyon, snow skiing in the winter. And then 10 minutes or 15 minutes down the way, I've got the strip with all of the best hotels, bars, casino, amazing shows, sports, boxing, UFC, you name it. It's down there type thing, all the best concerts. And so, yeah, we get very spoiled living in this city and it's an amazing hospitality city. But yeah, I chose Vegas uh, business wise because it's great for business. Uh, California is where we first moved to when we moved to America and cost of living, taxes, everything in California is very, very high. Whereas Nevada, the cost of living is much lower uh, employment costs are lower and obviously taxes are much lower. Our state tax, different to Australia. See, in Australia, you don't have a separate tax per state yeah, other I know. than maybe your, your rates. But here you have an income tax per state. Nevada, because of the fact that we have the casinos, has no income tax, uh, state income tax. You still pay federal income tax, of course, but no state income tax. So how much is federal income tax? Is out of curiosity? Uh, it really varies now. The new uh, Trump administration has reduced our taxes quite dr- drastically um, to spur on the economy. So uh, anywhere from, you know, business will run 18 to 30 percent, anywhere in that bracket is or 15 to 30 percent, depending on uh, the type of business you're in and the, and the employee re- number of employees and all that stuff. Let's put it this way, much less than in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> So if you have a company and your company pays tax and then you pay yourself a wage, do you have to pay tax out of that wage? Uh, depends on whether it's a personal exertion company like a lawyer or a doctor or that, then, then they do. If it's a normal corporate entity, it's a different structure. So these things have all come about in the last two years. It's totally changed. I remember coming back to Australia, giving a speech. Uh, it was small business week and uh, Kevin Rudd was running for prime minister against oh, uh, Kevin Sir John. Sir John Howard. I always uh, call him Sir John. I think he was the best prime minister we've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was. Ke- and, I think the um, campaign was Kevin 07. It was. Um, yeah, Kev- it was. Oh. See, these days <laughs> you win an election. These days, based on your your hashtag or your or your, your uh, motto, Scomo had to win. That's why Anthony Anthony Albanese is never going to win based on his hashtag. No, but did, um, wasn't that funny yeah. though that the uh, the opposition party were calling him Scomo, but they were trying to use that as a negative. And all of a sudden, yeah. they got hold of that, and they used that as part of their campaign. And then when he yep. won the election, the whole crowd is going "Sco Mo, Sco Mo." And now, I tell you, with that with that nickname and that hashtag, I can't see him getting voted out. You know, it's an interesting one. It's there's now, everyone always gets voted out eventually. John oh, Howard yeah. proved that. Uh, you know, down in Victoria, uh, Bloody Kev proved that as well. Um, but the point of it is that. You know, I see Australia as this country of amazing entrepreneurs because it's a tough. When I gave that speech, I was between the two of them. Kevin spoke on the night time, and uh, John Howard spoke at the the luncheon the next day, and I spoke in the middle. Oh, sorry, other way round. John Howard spoke first, and Kevin second. And uh, I tried to teach people that Australian entrepreneurs are some of the most amazing entrepreneurs in the world because we have such a tough economy to be successful in a very small population, massive distribution costs, huge wage expenses, yeah. ridiculous holiday pay that we have to give people, you True. know, four weeks plus 13 days public holiday plus 10 days of personal days. You know, it's just, it's incredible. I remember negotiating in Japan one time and they looked at me as if I was lying when I told them about the 17.5% leave loading. So if you can succeed in Australia and you don't go global, I think you're crazy. I think you're insane. People always say, oh, Brad, why did you go to America? Well, was, you know, I was a big fish in a little pond. I want to become a small fish in a big pond. You know, I live here in Las Vegas and there's more than a dozen billionaires that live in my city. And, and you know, to the point where only two of them actually count because they're worth 50 and 60 billion. So the others are sort of, you know, they only got four billion. Oh, you don't really even count. Um, small and, fish. And well, you, you got to understand, mate, that when you're trying to take on the world uh, from a business perspective, doing it from Australia is tough because time zone wise, you, you're off time zone for the two biggest markets uh, economically. But now you look at it, the, t- the biggest markets are going to be India and China. So India is my bet of the two. It's it's incredible what you said about Australia, though. With If you can make it here, you can make it almost anywhere. 
And mm. I think it was in 1994 I was in America and we were looking at some equipment over there and there was a company there that wanted to set up in Australia and they asked if I wanted to sort of head it up for them. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I could do that. And then they showed me their budget and I went, well, what's this part of staff costs? And they went, yeah, well, the you know, two weeks holiday. And I went, no, 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 it's four. And they went, oh, and I said, and then I said loading and then holiday pay and then sick pay and yeah, yeah. care. Yeah, and they just went, you're kidding me. And they sat down, did the figures and went, no, nah, nah, it's too hard. So they didn't do yeah, it. For, because what you got to remember, and, and, you know, as much as I love Australia, I still have my home there up on Hamilton Island. As much as I love Australia, economically, here in the US, you might as well just open in Florida. Yeah. You know, Florida, you've got it sitting there. It's got more people in Australia, more economic. The, the dollar is the US dollar. And these are some of the things you have to look for when, when you're looking at it. Canada is just up the way. There's 30 million people. Uh, California's 30 something, Texas 30, you know. Th so these are some of the challenges you have with US companies coming to Australia and why it took so long for companies like Amazon and Pottery Barn and that to come to Australia and why, you know, the price of cars are dropping dramatically because we're not making them in Australia anymore. But I, I, I love the Australian entrepreneur and I think that they should be thinking global far more than they do. I, I really, really do. I encourage it every day. So you, you've got a new book that's been released, and what, what number book is this? How many have you written so far? Number 17, this one. Yeah, I think, out of a hat. yeah I think I read about the first 11. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, catch up, catch up, buddy. Come I on, know. Dr. T. I know, <laughs> I know. How, how slack am I? Actually, the one I wrote before this, I wrote a book on wealth for people to be able to teach their kids money. And uh, halfway through it, I actually realized that uh, – Hang on, most parents don't know anything about money, so I had to go back and rewrite the book so parents would be able to learn it as well as kids. That's true. Yeah, we remember uh, um, meeting Robert Kiyosaki. He came up to Cairns as well uh, many years ago. Wouldn't have been actually, it wasn't that long after uh, I'd met you. And yeah, he used to have the, the game, the cash flow game for kids. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. He still has it. He and Sharon Lecter wrote that great book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is yeah. now literally the number one best-selling uh, business self-help book ever. Um, so, yeah, kind of crazy. Yeah, well, uh, I think last year, year before, I go to this event in Arizona every year called uh, Business Black Ops. And yep. I think two years ago, I was sitting next to Robert Kiyosaki's uh, PR guy. And, and that was an interesting conversation. <laughs> he was a really nice bloke and he just said, yeah, he said he still keeps really, really busy. He said all based off of just a, an idea or a concept from that, that first book, Richard Dad, Poor Dad. Well, interestingly enough, when you look at it from a marketing perspective, that book was actually written as a brochure. It was written as a brochure for the board game. It was never meant to be a book in and of itself, but it became a, a, a massive phenomenon. So... You never know what marketing will work. You just got to keep doing it out there and getting it out there. So yeah, so mm. so pulling profits out of a hat—that's your latest mm -hmm. book. And yep. uh, did I see Penn from Penn and Teller pull a book out of a hat? Yeah, it's it's interesting living in Vegas. Our kids uh, go to school with Penn and Emily's kids, and uh, I said to Penn, "Can you just pull this out of a hat for me, just to make it fun?" And he did. Uh, he made fun <laughs> of it, but uh, that's Penn's sense of humour, of course. Yeah, um, very funny man. So to get him to pull your book out of a hat is uh, is pretty cool. Well, it's very lucky uh, when uh, our hockey team, our ice hockey team here in Vegas, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, were playing for the Stanley Cup last season, and uh, Penn was doing a thing in his uh, studio, and his wife called me and said, "Bring the baby down." My baby was born just as they were playing that, and I put the baby in the actual Stanley Cup for a photo. It was kind of fun, but. Yeah, you know, I, I wrote this book because some people do think it's magic the way companies make a bunch of money and the way companies do a whole bunch of profits and stuff. And I wanted to show people that it's not actually magic. Exponential growth or massive growth in a business isn't magic. It's a formula that anyone can learn and anyone can follow. And whether you're the biggest business in the world or the newest startup, it's still the same five core disciplines that you have to get right uh, to be able to get the results that you want to get. If this is the first book, if this is the first Brad Sugar's book they've ever picked up and they start reading, what are they getting right at the beginning of the book? Well, what they're learning is how uh, a business grows exponentially. In other words, how a business has year on year on year growth. What are the key factors for that? And we call them disciplines because they're not the sort of thing that you can just do once and then walk away from. So the five disciplines are strategy, business development, people, execution, and mission. So each of those 
disciplines works in conjunction with the other and how they work together. And when you get all five of them working, that's when the business starts adding zeros to its bottom line, when it starts to actually multiply the profits and get exponential profit growth rather than just, you know, percentage based profit growth. Okay. And what do you mean by adding zeros? So instead of saying, okay, I want to grow by 15%, well, why don't we grow by 15 times? You know, why don't we do instead of, you know, adding 10% to the business, double the business, add a zero to what we're doing, you know, 10 times, 20 times. And people look at it and say, well, that's kind of, you can't really do that in business. Well, hang on a sec. Let's go back to when, uh, actually, what's that movie? Uh, the Founder with Ray Kroc. Did you get a chance to ever see that one? Yeah, I've, I've seen it. Well, I watched it when it came out and then I bought the DVD and I watch it New Year's Day every year. There you go. I think it should have been called The Finder though because he didn't actually found McDonald's. He, he <laughs> oh, look what I just found. You know, he was a finder. And, and literally that's what I do today. I find good companies that are in one city. We just bought a share of a, a commercial cleaning business down in Melbourne actually that we're now taking to England and here to the United States. I uh, just bought a share of a property management company in Houston, Texas that we're now taking all over the US. That'll Again, only one office in one city uh, by the end of building that, we'll end up with about 2,200 offices across the United States. Um, and, and see, they're just, there's people sort of ask, what's the reasoning for going to the States? Well, there you go, 2,200 offices versus in Australia, at the most, you'd maybe get 100 offices type thing. Uh, if you really pushed it, probably more like 50. Um, but uh, in, in doing that, what Ray Kroc did is he said, okay, I found this great little business that the McDonald brothers built. It's a great little burger business. Now my job is to put it everywhere in the country on every street corner. And then he worked out, hang on, not just in America, in every street corner in the world. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of business people go wrong. Once you get the fundamental core of the business, right, your goal is to then expand it to as many places around the world or around the country or around at least the state as you possibly can. So that's really the core of what I look for in growing businesses that I buy today. So do you do a similar thing to Ray Kroc where eventually they figured out the property was the, was the big value, owning the property was the value? So yeah. do you do that with in, your In some coaches? businesses, in some businesses, the core, we, we do have an asset-based strategy. Um, but an asset-based strategy doesn't always have to be real estate. If you go back to the first real asset-based strategy, Aristotle Onassis, was the one that stumbled upon what the you know aristocracy were doing, where the ships were the asset that they were buying, and you know they they bought these ships just by running them all sort of thing, and so the ship was the actual asset that you're buying. So any business can build an asset based strategy if you think about it hard enough, and even the medical business, you know, again people say, oh, you know, you don't want to own your own building. Well, hang on, wouldn't oh, you rather yes, pay you rent to your own? <laughs> I, I would rather pay rent to my own superannuation fund than someone else's. It brings us to a great lesson in business, and that is that you should be being paid at three levels in business. Number one is the cash flow, and whether you call that wages or profit or whatever, but the cash flow should be paying. Number two, it should be paying for some assets for you. It should be buying you an asset. And number three, you need to be building an asset or a saleable asset in and of itself. And that's where if you don't – the first goal I teach every business owner to set – Every entrepreneur should set one goal on the day they start the business or buy the business. And that is on what day will this business run without you? Yeah. Because if, if you can't set the goal of, you know, the day the business will run without you, then you miss the whole point of owning your own business. You know, the point of owning your own business is to build a saleable asset. I remember I was lucky enough, I was uh, about six or seven years old. And a friend of my dad's was our milkman. If, do you remember the days when the milker used to drop the I bottles do. of milk? You yeah, know, I glass do bottle, that. Glass bottle milk back in those days. Yeah, you'd hear him clinking and, down the road. That's right. And he was a friend of my dad's. And we went to his house for a barbecue. And uh, we pulled up at his house and it's this massive, big flash house. And I'm just looking at it going, Dad, is our milkman rich? He said, well, yes, son. He's done well for himself. I said, Dad, how does a milkman get to be rich? He said, well, I don't know, son. Why don't you ask him? So, of course, being a five-year-old or six-year-old young Australian boy, uh, my level of tact was, was minus five. Yep. You know, I mean, whatever it was. So I run inside and say, you're our milkman, right? And he said, yeah. I said, how does a milkman get to be rich? And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, son, let me teach you. And his words exactly were, and I didn't understand it at all at the time, but his words were, son, you don't get rich selling the milk. You get rich selling the milk run. Yeah. Now, 
you know, I didn't get that at the time, but now it makes total sense. You're selling the businesses where the most money is made. You know, Bill Gates isn't one of the richest people in the world because of the profits of Microsoft. It's because of the capital value of his company. You know, that's that's where a lot of business owners don't even know the capital value of their business. And, and that's the craziness of it. That's why big business has a massive advantage over small business. They have shareholders who want capital value. Um, and, and the shareholders demand growth and demand profitability. That's why, you know, when people say, why does business coaching work? Well, there's one very important reason, accountability. You know, big companies have accountability. Small businesses don't have accountability to anyone. Therefore, they don't have to grow. Yeah, as long as true. they're paying the bills, as long as they're paying the bills. I mean, I'll be real blunt about it. If you're the owner of the business and the CEO of the business, then you work for a crazy person. Um, <laughs> I've done that before. I've done that for a few years. Yeah, I mean, but let's let's be really thinking about this, right? Because ultimately, if if you are the CEO and the owner of the business, you're not pushing the CEO hard enough, and therefore no one is really growing the business to the level with which the business should be grown. So, you know, I, I, I like to think that we teach people to be great business owners, not just great CEOs. Yeah, there's a couple of points here I want to point I, I want to mention. One was when you said about if you're the business owner, I remember when I was at your event and uh, you said, okay, everyone stand up who owns their own business, who is the business owner. So mm. yeah, probably 90% of the room stood up. Not everyone was a business owner. And you said, stay standing if you could, uh, you don't have to go to work tomorrow. You, you just choose right now. I'm not going to go to work tomorrow. So a lot of the room sat down, a few of us stayed standing up. You asked another question and a few more sat down and I think I was standing up with about six other people. And then your last question was, okay, could you just jump on a plane tomorrow and disappear for four weeks and not tell anyone at work where you've gone and come back and everything be normal and be running perfectly? <laughs> we all sat down. He said, you don't own a business yet. Yeah, mate, that, was, that goes back to my definition of a business. De a business is a commercial profitable enterprise that works without you. Yes. Um, you know, and I... I and it doesn't matter whether you're in the medical field or any other field. I remember one of my clients uh, or one of our coaches' clients over here, Atlanta, Georgia. Here's a guy. He was uh, the the chair of the board of, uh, of uh, heart surgeons, right? And I forget the exact terminology, whatever it is, but I had a few beers with him one night talking about this. And here he was in his mid-50s, and then something happened to him, and he had to go in and have a couple of stents put in. And boom, he sat back and he went, oh, my God. I am the business. If anything happens to me, I don't have a business. So he now has a business with 20 odd doctors working for him, big surgery center, all that sort of stuff, five, six years later, because he actually got it that I can't, I have to become a business person first and a doctor second. Yeah. But I just want to point out to people, if anyone's listening to this and they're working in the business, say they're a podiatrist or a doctor or the yeah, other, other field, and they love doing what they're doing doesn't mean you have to give it up. It just means you have a choice to stop or cut back when you feel like it or take a break. Well, you have to be able to give it up. Yeah. And that's that's a big, big differentiator for a lot of people because if you're not able to give it up, then what ends up happening is when, when you do want to give it up, you end up having to basically give it away you know? because when you go to sell, and this is where a lot of people struggle with this whole concept of it. If you want to actually make real money selling a business – then you've actually got to sell a business, which means you're selling an asset because otherwise the only thing you can sell is your podiatrist business to another podiatrist. Yeah, true. No, no one else can buy it. Therefore, you're not going to get the massive amount of money that you could have or should have got. I, you know, All businesses where they get lower multiples are businesses where they're selling a job rather than a business. Yeah, and that was when I sold my podiatry business. The best part about it was I didn't work in it. I didn't work there anymore. I used to just turn up every now and then just to make sure things were running. Yes, yeah, so I worked zero day, days per week. I had podiatrists already that were lined up all working. The business basically ran without me, even though I still <laughs> oversaw what was going on. So when they purchased it off me, I, I wasn't part of the deal. I didn't have to work yeah. there when it was sold. They, they knew what they, were, what they saw was what they were actually getting. It wasn't my input that was keeping it running. That's right. If you're the CEO and you're also working there and you're working for a lunatic and you won't push yourself as much, this comes back to the benefit of having a business coach because the business coach will push you more than you'll push yourself, just like any other coach. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, look, I know, I'm, and I'm after I get off the call with you today, I'm chatting to two of my long-term coaches in Australia. Um, and and look, there's three reasons coaching works. One is the knowledge it brings. Two is the accountability that they bring to the table. And the third is that they can see the forest for the trees. You know, an outsider looking in will see stuff for what it really is. Um, you know, it's, it's any business owner, if I said to them, hey, go and look at that guy's business and tell me 10 things they're doing wrong, they could very quickly see it. And then you say to them, okay, look at your own business and tell me 10 things you're doing wrong. It's very hard to see it in your own business. Okay, you've got the, the biggest coaching business in the world, yet Brad Sugars has a coach. And I have three different coaches, one for finance, one for business, and one for life. So, um, yeah, you gotta, you got to, I mean, if you don't eat your own cooking... Um, yeah, what they say in the, in the um, IT world, you got to eat your own dog food. <laughs> I remember when I had my dog food business down there in Australia, down in Melbourne, Melbourne and Sydney, trophy dog food. There you go. I do recall. I recall listening long, to that. Long time back. Well, that's where my book, uh, Buying Customers, came out of that business because what I had to learn in that business was exactly how to buy the right number of new customers per week. Because you know, a lot of businesses, you say to them, how many new customers do you want a week? And they go, oh, as many as I can get. Well, no, not really. You want to have a certain number because if you get too many, then your customer service is going to go way down. And if you get too few, then you're not getting enough to keep your staff busy and your cash flow moving and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's interesting when people sort of think that they want that. In that business, we had to put vans on the road. And so every time you put a van on the road, you needed X number of new customers per week to get the van loaded up and busy. Otherwise, your asset was a waste of an asset. So... Yeah, that was a fun business. So fun you business. let the uh, when, when you're talking with business, say about expanding because uh, same thing. Like I'll I do coaching with podiatrists and dentists mainly, mm. and and occasionally a few of them say, "Oh, I want to employ somebody else." And I go, "Okay, mm -hmm. well, instead of us talking about whether you should or should not employ you know, an associate, take a look at the numbers and let the numbers help you make the decision. If the numbers say you can, then you do. If the numbers say you shouldn't, then you shouldn't. How how much emphasis do you put on the numbers of the business to help make decisions? You know, I mean, I'm just, I guess I was an accountant by training. So everything I do has numbers involved in the decision making. Um, but when it looks at marketing, I look at marketing from a different perspective. You know, if I've got to buy a hundred customers and each customer costs me $30 to buy, but I make a hundred dollars on the first sale from them, then I can afford to buy as many customers as my service team can handle. You know, look, I, I I'm a firm believer in planning a business. Uh, we make sure all of our customers plan their business every 90 days. Once they've been through the 90 day cycle for a year, we then get them doing annual planning. Once they've done annual planning twice, we then get them to do a three to five year strategic plan. So you know, I, that's where I'm a firm believer in knowing where you're going because you planned it. Yeah, that makes sense. So going, going back to your book, because I know it's, when did they come out? It's only, it's only quite it's only recent. It's only four weeks old. We've already New York, We've already hit Wall Street Journal, Amazon, uh, USA Today bestseller lists. So yeah, we're doing pretty good. Doing pretty good off the day, off off the beginning. So basically, if anyone wants to get a copy, they can just go to any online book place, and I take it through America to be right through all the bookstores. Yeah, it's through all the airport bookstores throughout the United States and uh, through. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, Aussie, I've seen it on a bunch of different sites down there, Amazon, of course. But uh, is, it on, is it on bookshelves in Australia as well? Uh, not yet, I don't believe. I don't believe the publishers have put it onto the bookshelves anywhere other than the United States, Canada at this point, uh, because they have a whole worldwide rollout plan for the next uh, 12 months or two years. If you, actually, it's two years full to get it rolled out for the entire world. Oh, wow. So how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, this book took about two years worth two, two years worth of working and researching and using the concepts with our clients to prove out the concepts, researching clients who are using them and all that sort of stuff. But um, you know, when you go backwards and say, you know, it's not magic to grow a business that way, it's actually a system you have to um, go through. And that's where the five core disciplines all fall into place and you know, business people get real results from it. So those five disciplines that you mentioned before, can you just run through those five again, but a little bit slower? Because you tend to talk pretty fast. Considering you considering you live in America now, I think that's why you're talking so much faster than you used to. Yeah, you know, I married a girl from Boston. They're from stuck over this side of the world. Um, <laughs> five five kids. Uh, they're, 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 there's all the kids are now as American dual citizens. Uh, I become a dual citizen in, a, in about a month's time. So... 
I uh, get to still be an Aussie and be an American at the same time. But the five disciplines, strategy is number, well, they're not really in any order. Uh, they Because some businesses are good at two or three and they're different two or three to the next business. Yeah. So strategy, business development, people, execution, mission. Um, so strategy, let's look there first. Strategy is really about the business model, not about, oh, we've got a strategy using Facebook advertising. That's more of a tactic. Strategy is where you look at the core of the business and say, okay, how is this business actually structured? So it looks at four main things. Leverage, and my definition of leverage is do the work once, get paid forever. I like so that. it's really, it, it, yeah, well, look, once I started teaching people leverage in that manner, they started to understand the difference between employees' work and owners' work. You know, an employee does the work once and gets paid once, and owners' work is where you do the work once and get paid long term or forever. Um, and if you, if you do an employee's work all day, every day, you won't make any more money than your employees do. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, and that's, that's where a lot of business owners go wrong. Um, but you look at the core of a strategy of a business. Is it getting a customer once who stays with you forever? Is it getting, you know, and, and doing that is the business model set up for that, or is the business model designed to actually be, as it gets bigger, it gets harder for the, the boss or the owner of the business type of thing. So we always look at, at the, that. Then the second part of strategy is leverage. Oh, sorry, is, uh, is scalability. And scalability by design, again, is where we sit down and we say, okay, the next sale costs less and gets easier. So the next sale should be easier than the first sale. I remember uh, my rental business back there in Australia, Mr. Rentals, I'm out of that from a long time now. But Mr. Rentals, you're renting out fridges, freezers, TVs, white and brown goods, basically. You know, the first fridge to rent that took a lot of work, but to rent out fridge number 200 or 500 or 1,000, that was a lot less work than fridge number one. And I think Mr. Rentals uh, is still going. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still going. The team there are a great team. Uh, some great partners in that business are doing a phenomenal job, uh, still running it today. Um, so when you then take a look at, okay, we've got uh, the, the whole idea of scalability in this day and age, for scale to really happen, what you've got to do is almost remove the human element of the purchase transaction. Um, and where we see a, a human element in the transaction, scalability gets harder and harder. Not to say it's not possible, but it's harder and harder. If you look at just a simple example of, say, Uber, all Uber did was remove the human element of getting a taxi. You know, you used to have to call someone. There'd be someone on the end of the phone. They would then place a call to someone to get a taxi, and then it would... Now it's just a technology application. It removes it. So the scale is much simpler. Yeah. And then you've then you got uh, opportunity size and marketability that are also part of strategy. And so when I sit with a business about strategy and I've sat with some of the biggest companies in the world and some of the smallest startups, there is no, if, if you have not sat and designed the strategy, then you've probably got the wrong strategy for growth on a massive scale. Do you um, think that's where some people fail? They don't, they don't, do that initial step. They don't get that strategy oh. part right from the beginning. They just like a bull out of a gate and then, then they try and do the strategy after everything's all, all the turmoil has started and they go, oh, maybe we need some strategy behind our thinking. Yeah, you know, look, but even strategies have to shift and change. Yeah. If you look at, uh, let's say Apple as a simple example, Apple started with a strategy of manufacture a computer. So build it and sell it. So bake a computer once and sell it once. And that worked when no one owned a computer. Once everyone owned computers and Apple computers had, didn't have built in, they break down every two years and you got to throw it out and buy a new one. So they had a challenge. Steve Jobs had to come back and use a different strategy. I mean, luckily enough, while working in Pixar or owning and building Pixar as a movie company, Jobs went and learned both great leadership and management, but he also learned leverage, how to make a movie once and sell it forever. So he goes back to Apple, puts them into the music business and, you know, they they don't even make the songs. I mean, this is the crazy thing. Apple, he's such a genius. He went from a company almost going bankrupt to the biggest company in the world because they don't make anything and yet they sell everything and uh, they take <laughs> a cut of it forever in a day. They yeah. don't make any apps. They take 40 cents in the dollar for apps. They don't make any music or movies or TV shows and yet they take 30 cents in the dollar for everyone they sell. Genius strategy. But you could see, so you look at being in the music business. Apple's one end of the scale or Spotify, Apple, they're at one end of the scale of the music business. The other end of the scale is a guy playing as a drummer in a band getting paid a few dollars on a Friday night to be the drummer. You know what I mean? You can be at any level of that scale and, a, 
and, and it's the same for the medical business. You know, you, you, podiatrist, you can be the podiatrist doing the work or you can be someone running the big business at the other end. It's different strategies for different people. Yeah, that makes sense. So but move on to the next one, the, the business development. Business development is where you combine sales, marketing, and customer service. So that's all parts of business development. And again, it's business development is pretty easy if you don't want to have a growth business. If you've got a business that's just, you know, adding, if you're just trying to replace a lost customer, business development's real easy. But if you're in a business that's growing and opening up new offices around the world, then you actually have to really focus in on the discipline of business development. You actually have to get great at marketing, attracting business to you, not going out and chasing business. That's sales. You got to have people coming to you, calling you, emailing you and buying straight off, you know, and then you got to get your customer service policies and everything in play so that everything works from there. So you get great repeat business because as we all know, repeat business equals profit. Oh yeah, it does. And and that's, I think sometimes business owners, they're so quick to move on to the next new customer that they forget about the one that they've already got in their business and getting them yeah. back and getting them back more <laughs> often and offering like them the, more each time. The gymnasium. I love gymnasiums from that perspective. Like, yeah, yeah, we got a new customer. Great. You just lost 20 out the back door. Yeah. I was at like gym memberships. Yeah. Yeah. No, crazy in that front. So, then uh, people is next, um, and I think this is a massive one that gets missed by a lot of people is that if, if you grow your people, they'll grow your business. If you don't grow your people, they can't grow your business. No one's ever outperformed their training, if that's the simplest way to put it. And, uh, I actually had a gentleman in Ireland recently uh, argue with me on this point. He said, but Brad, when I train my people, they leave. And I said, yeah, I don't know. And if you don't, they'll stay. <laughs> I've heard somebody else say that once before too. And uh, yeah, you got to laugh. I remember uh, actually just was it, uh, last year I was doing a speech in Dublin. And it was kind of fun because before me was Lady Michelle Moan speaking. And uh, Michelle is a baroness in the House of Lords. And after me was Sir Richard Branson. So it was like the, the lady, the convict, and the Lord. This is fantastic. You know, throw an <laughs> Aussie between the lady and the Lord. Um, but Sir Richard was, he, as I came off stage, uh, we shook hands, he went up. We actually had a little laugh because both of us were in blue jeans, a white shirt, and a black blazer. It's like he's got the mane, though. He's got the beautiful hair. Oh, it doesn't. Um, yeah, and and uh, we're having a bit of a laugh. But uh, for one of the questions he was asked, they said to him, you know, have you had to change management now because of the millennial generation? And he looked at the guy and he says, no, we've always done good management. Um, and, and that to me was one of those things that I sort of sat there and went, yeah, see, a lot of people just don't get it. You know, you've got to build a great company that people want to be a part of and that people want to work in. And, um, you know, it's, that's really what we're looking to build. So that goes back to like building the culture of your business and having people join your business that fit your culture, not trying to adapt your culture to fit every new person that keeps joining. And therefore, there is no culture. Yeah, well, if you go to the discipline of mission, mission talks about what is the value of the company over and above making a profit. See, I use the word love in business, and, and that is, do your customers love buying from you? Not just, you know, not just it's okay, do they love buying from you? Do your staff love coming to work? Not just, oh, yeah, we go there and we get paid and, you know, I got a good, good enough boss. You know, the old axiom of uh, people leave a manager, not a company is still true to this day. But when you look at the mission of an organization, because 20 years ago, you could have a mission, you could have a company that didn't really, you know, need a mission, you know, it was just about the profits. Because when you're dealing with, you know, the baby boomer generation, to get them to do their job, you just had to say, hey, do your job. And they did it. That was the extent of management. Yeah. Somewhere in the 90s, management became a bad word. And, and that's why we now see so many books on execution, because there's no management anymore. Therefore, execution is lacking. Um, so what we have to do is look at that. And, you know, I see this whole millennial generation, they should be called the Y generation, W-H-Y. The number one answer to them is why are we doing this? And that's where, where Sir Richard said, you know, what we do is we've actually explained why forever and a, a day. We, we use the, the why we're doing it, our mission, what we're here to achieve. Because when you see, like there's plenty of companies that have tried to emulate what Sir Richard does but not been able to do it because that spark, that why, that mission that people love coming to work and love being a part of that organisation just doesn't appear. Um, and, and, you know, so millennials have turned us into having to do great management. And I always laugh when people go, oh, the millennials, they're the laziest generation ever. 
I remember my generation being called that. And I was with someone the other day and he, he grew up in the 60s and he said, oh, they're so lazy, the millennials. I said, do you, do you not remember what your generation was described as? And he looked at me and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but I think that's all the way... That's all the way through because I saw a photo on Facebook. Oh, it might have been a year ago, and it's it's done. It's gone the circles a few times, and it showed a photograph of a bunch of millennials on a train, and they're all got the heads down, they're looking at the mobile phones or iPads or laptops, and they go, and then it had like 2018, then it had uh, 1958, and it had the whole uh, a train there, and all these people probably around the same age, but they're all reading the newspaper. No one was talking right. to each other. So yeah. they, they could sit there and bag millennials and say, oh, look at them, they don't talk with each other, they're always on their phones. But back 60 years before that, or reading the newspaper. Here's the interesting thing, right? I, I've, we hire a bunch of millennials in different companies and one of our brands, we actually only hire millennials in there because we're doing a lot of online selling and our online selling department, if I try and get, like my CFO of all of our brands, uh, Tony's in his late or mid-60s, mid-60s. And whenever the, the team from that company comes forward and tries to present something to Tony, you know, they always laugh and they go, really, boss, we've got to get Tony to understand this? I said, yes, because if Tony doesn't understand it, no one's going to understand this thing. It's too bloody hard. So, you know, we always joke about it. But my goodness me, when you look at the funnel, you know, in, if you go back and say, okay, there used to be these things called infomercials. Well, now there's still infomercials. They're just all online. Yeah. You know, and you see the level with which we're getting amazing results from businesses that are doing things online that are just way, way, way out of the mindset of anyone. This is where, you know, I remember Bill Gates being interviewed many moons ago saying, listen, there's probably a kid in a garage somewhere trying to put Microsoft out of business so we can stay ahead. And he, he was damn close to it. It wasn't a kid though in a garage. It was two kids in a, in a dorm room, Larry and Sergey. You know, they built Google and almost put Microsoft out of business. You know, there's... These are some of the things that people need to understand. Microsoft, dang, if it wasn't for this new CEO, Microsoft was getting close to going out of business. This new CEO has turned it into a phenomenal business, re-strategized the whole thing. They don't sell software anymore. They rent you the software. And you've got to, you know, you pay your ongoing rental for your software with Microsoft. And now that business is booming again. Do you know what I mean? It's it's kind of crazy. Hasn't there been a big change though? Is we, we don't really own too much anymore. Everything is on a subscription sort of basis. Yeah, and that's because businesses understand that strategy is a far better strategy than selling at once. Yeah. You know, you, you look at uh, all of the rental businesses in Australia. Yeah, they're not making any money. Oh yeah, they're making so much money that they actually go on TV ads for the bank showing how dang good they are. You know, that's how good they are. So, so when we you know, went through those five five parts, we had strategy was one, two was business development, three was people. We jumped okay. four and we went to mission, which was number five. So number four was execution. Because execution is really where, you know, the rubber hits the road. And this is where management, planning, systemization. I mean, you just look at checklists. I, I, I'm a firm lover of checklists in business. And I, I've always said, you know, would you get on an aeroplane if the pilot didn't do the pre-flight checklist? Well, no, you wouldn't. Why no. not? Well, I want to live. How often do you want to live on an aeroplane? Well, every single time. Great. So if you want your people to do a great job every single time, they need to have a checklist for every single thing they do. And if you want, if you want consistent performance, then you need a checklist. It's not, not a complex algorithm. This is pretty dang simple. But unless you do that, you're not going to get the results you want. But you know, when you combine, and again, like with business development, if you're just replacing a lost customer, um, execution's not that hard. But if you're in a growth-oriented business, opening new offices or opening new things, like for us, we open in a new country approximately every month. We open a new country somewhere in the world approximately once a month, sometimes every two months. Like we just opened in Russia. And to open in Russia, we have a full systemization of here's how we open a new country. Here is the steps. Here's the thing. Like, you know, how often do you think Subway opens a new sandwich store somewhere in the world? Every day they're opening between two and five stores a day. Yeah. So they've got a full system for opening stores and a whole team just doing that. So, again, it's, it's different levels for different levels of growth. But as you start planning your growth and seeing where you're going, 
obviously the game changes and the level of execution needed changes. Okay, so before we before we wind up, there's just a couple of th- more things I want to ask you about. So, so with this particular book, we know you can get that everywhere. You've written mm-hmm. 17 books. If somebody read this book and they went, holy crap, I really like that. This Brad Sugars guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. What would be the next book that you would recommend of your 17 that they should read? Oh, dang. See, that, that's a tough question because it's going to be different for everybody. <laughs> See, if, they're, if, they're, if they're young and they don't and they want to, and they're in startup mode, I'd recommend Billionaire in Training because that then gives them an understanding of how is wealth created through business? What should they be doing? Um, but then if you flip it over and say, okay, maybe their problem is mostly systems, then obviously instant systems. Or if it's team building, then the team building book. And I think that's different. I'll put it really bluntly, right, to make this really easy for everyone, Dr. T. Just buy all of them. Just just get on. Buy all 17 and, and, and don't worry about it. Just do a bulk order. And that was what I was yeah, actually going to say, that maybe they just <laughs> they just need to buy more. I'm looking forward to reading this next one. You know, it, it's interesting. Um it's my biggest book ever, 390-something pages. It weighs uh, uh, probably a kilo and a half. And um, it's, it's a big dang book. But we fully graphic de- designed and full color printed the whole book because, uh, in my opinion, learning needs to be made easy. And sometimes graphics make it easier to understand the point that is tr- being made uh, through what you're doing. So... That to me was sort of one of the big things for us. Yeah, using visual models or just visually explaining something too. Because some people don't, yeah, they can read things that uh, 10 times and it goes in one ear and out the other. But when they see it visually, that picture can actually sits in their mind better. And that's why, you know, I, I remember always being one of the teachers that my goal was to make everything simple. You know, I remember reading a quote from Einstein where he said, you know, I forget, I'll have to paraphrase it, but it was, if you can't teach it simply, you don't know it well enough to be teaching. It's, it's not his exact words. And so my goal has always been that. And I remember one of my accountants many years ago down in Melbourne, Australia, um, he said to me, Brad, we should call you sucrose. You're like a simple sugars. You make everything seem so bloody simple. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's thanks, funny. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Harry. Sucrose. Um, but, you know, that was it was an interesting one that, as a teacher, my job has always been to simplify. And that's why I've been lucky enough having bought into so many companies and having run so many companies that um, literally these days, uh, you know, every lesson comes from it. Like you know, a company that I partnered with down in Australia, Engage and Grow, where Rich Maloney, a young guy from Melbourne, Australia, who has this amazing employee engagement program, you know, I bought a share of Rich's business and now it's all operating all over the world. More than 60 countries are finalist in the Telstra Entrepreneur uh, Export of the Year. I uh, just invested with a young guy also down in Australia, Travis Bell, who's known as the bucket list guy uh, and helping him take his business. He's now operating in 14 countries around the world with people certified as bucket list coaches all over the world. So. Uh, another another guy in uh, Brisbane there, Nick Clark, who built an amazing business planning system and has a virtual CFO system that now I've taken that all over the world. We're now opening all across uh, England and then we'll open the rest of the world. So mate, I love the Aussie entrepreneurs and I love backing a lot of them to help them open up all over the world because I think they're great. I think it's fantastic. And if people want to reach out to you or find more information about you, what's the best way of contacting Brad Sugars? Um, jump on any social media, uh, you know, Insta, Face, uh, <laughs> YouTube, LinkedIn. I'm on all of them. Uh, not Pinterest, though. I'm not very crafty. Um, yeah, I, but, found, you on, uh, I all... found you on Facebook this morning. Well, actually, yeah, I found yeah. you on a- Facebook a while action ago. Coach, actioncoach.com or bradsugars.com, any of those. Uh, the new book, if you can't find it, just jump on pullingprofits.com and order it direct from us. Okay. I think they're, they're, that's a good idea as well. Uh, one last question. I always uh, yes. ask a lot of people like a Monday morning tip. So it's Monday morning, person's waking up, they've walked into work, they've sat down. What's, what's the one thing you would tell them on a Monday morning just to kick their week off the right way? I would have told them on Friday afternoon, make a list of everything you've got to do and achieve next week. Uh, on Friday afternoon so that your Monday morning is dead simple. And then every single day of your life, make a list of what you've got to do the next day, what you need to achieve and do the next day. Uh, I've done that all my life and every single business that I own, every single employee does it. And our productivity levels are about 30% higher than most people. Um, If you write a list every day at the end of the day of what you've got to achieve the next day, life becomes very easy. I actually started doing it, my friend, because I couldn't leave work at work. 
Yeah. And so, uh, and then once I started doing this, it helped me learn to leave work at work and come home and be at home. And with five kids, um, it's kind of help, kind of helpful to be at home when I'm at home because there's there's a little bit of stuff to be done. I think that's good advice. Though, doing it on the Friday afternoon before you before you leave. And I had somebody else say once before that if you if you start planning your day that morning, then you're already behind. Yeah, you've already lost. You've got to if you if you plan your day before you leave the office. Yeah, you can leave work at work, but also your brain actually will magically enough your brain will go to work for the next X number of hours and come up with solutions to the vast majority of your challenges before you even show up at the door. You know, the, the brain's amazing like that. When you let it sit with an idea overnight, it'll come up with a lot of solutions. Okay, so Brad, I want to thank you for coming on It's No Secret with Dr. T. And, and I want people to know that the benefit of coaching, the benefit of reading books that have been written by people that have actually done things and, have, and are still doing it. So, yeah, have you got any p- final words? I, I just want to go back to the thing that I learned. Brisbane City Town Hall, 16 years of age, Jim Rohn, E. James Rohn. He said, son, if you want to be successful, read a book a week for the rest of your life. Simple as that. Yep, I think that's fantastic. And when I mentioned before, yeah, I went to your first event, 1998, and my business was going, ah, it was going okay. But it wasn't till that one week, two-day workshop that all of a sudden a switch went off in my head and things actually started to come together. And it was that five years later, uh, we won the Telstra Award, which was pretty cool. So I think it's also the benefit of attending live events because you don't know which one it's going to be. And you don't know which speaker it's going to be that will be the one that just sort of resonates with your thinking. There's another thing I'll say about that, mate, is that, you know, I, I, I think everyone should read and read a ton. But I also think that when you go to a live event, it's it's like you know, having the music on your on your iPod versus going to a concert. There's a shift in you as a human that happens at events that just cannot happen at, uh, at, at just by reading. So read the books, then go to the live events and keep on learning. No, I think that is a fa- that's fantastic advice to finish on. So, Brett, thank you very much. Dr. T, great to be here, my friend. If you're By the way, anyone listening to this, subscribe to his podcast. He's got some great people on here. See, that's, that's better when somebody else gives the endorsement and it's not just me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Welcome, buddy. Welcome. I love what you're doing. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Brad Sugars discussing his latest book, Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. And because the title comes about because pulling profits out of a business is not magic. There are disciplines that you need to follow, which he did discuss in quite good detail. So if you want to grow and scale your business, I think you need to take those five disciplines on board. And while we're talking about books, I must give my own two books a plug. First one, It's No Secret There's Money in Podiatry, which is very podiatry specific. And the second one, It's No Secret There's Money in Small Business. Both available on all your online book platforms. And I do have a third book coming out later on this year, so just stay tuned for that. Now, if you have any thoughts after listening to this particular episode, I would love to hear from you. You can leave comments on my website, tysonfranklin.com, or you can reach out to me on Facebook and LinkedIn. Just look for Tyson E. Franklin. So that's it for me this week. Look after yourself, look after your family, and I will talk to you again next week. Bye for now.